So tonight we have a special guest from Utica, New York, uh, John Zogby. I have known uh, John uh, for a number of years now. Uh, first, I think we met as a, um, because you were also uh, on the faculty at, uh, at SUNY IT, and there's a little interesting story that I have to tell you since I'm holding one of his books. Um, he has written, uh, you know, several really uh, great books, and if you haven't picked up a copy, uh, make sure you do that, uh, Neo Tribes Tribal Anal Analytics. But I remember John um, going on TV that, uh, uh, and behind his uh, chair at, at Utica uh, from our TV studio was, there's a big, thick book entitled SUNY IT, my, uh, our former institution. And there is no such book as SUNY IT. But it was cleverly uh, disguised to provide a wonderful PR opportunity for, uh, for the institution. And so maybe one day uh, the, uh, when we do a TV show for UW Bothell, there will be a cleverly disguised book, UW Bothell, behind him that will signify. But uh, I understand that he had um, a very interesting and a really great interview with uh, KUOW, which uh, there he spoke uh, a lot about and highly about uh, UW Bothell. So I appreciate those uh, good words about our institution. Um, and also, I want to uh, introduce uh, uh, Karam Dana, uh, who is the, the director, not only assistant professor here at University of Washington Bothell, but director of American Muslim Research Institute, which uh, uh, does a, a lot of advocacy work as well as analysis, analytics, and uh, really wonderful, uh, you know, scholarship that goes on at Amri. So, uh, you know, we're, who will be uh, moderating the uh, the questions and answers uh, after John's. Uh, uh, presentation. But without further ado, I am really excited that uh, John is here um, and of course yeah, uh, Zogby Analytics, Zogby Poll, which is very uh, u universal as Gallup and, uh, and other polls that are out there and um, now and better. Yeah, and better, absolutely. And uh, so if, but be very careful if you give him your email address, you're going to be flooded with all the analytics that you can, uh, you know, really want, and but they're actually really, really, really good. So, with that, uh, John. Thank you very much. Are we on? Yes, we're on. Wow! Thank you so much. When Wolf called in nine seconds, I said yes. He's a, a good friend. You stole him from us. We miss you very much. We still hope we'll get you back again. But in the meantime, you've got a very lovely spot here. Um, and I've met so many very nice friends. So we're going to talk a little bit about some politics tonight and some demographics. And we're going to talk about the candidates as well. And I'm going to savage everybody. So if, if your candidate isn't savaged up front, I'm going to be very even across the board. So I want to start with my Bernie story, if I can, which I, I hope you'll appreciate. So one of the little known secrets um, is that I ran for mayor of Utica in 1981. I was 32 years old. I didn't know any better. Um, big fro, big mustache. Uh, I was a Democratic socialist before it became fashionable, <laughs> and I lost. And the true story is that I was teaching at the time, and with my students, I did some polling throughout the race, which meant that I knew exactly how much I was going to lose by before <laughs> anybody else did, and I did. I did lose by that amount. I got trounced actually. And so one career died and one career was born all on that same night. I said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I'd rather be right than president. <laughs> at the same time, several years older than me, there was a big fro, big mustache guy from Brooklyn who was running for mayor of Burlington, Vermont. Cities the same exact size. And Bernie won. So a year later, 
Bernie and I are on a panel at Cornell together. The conference was the future of small cities. And it was Bernie and me. There are about 400 people in the room. There were a couple of babies crying in the back, one, one of whom was a Zogby. But there was one who was crying quite a bit. So I got up and I gave my talk, and I was done. So Bernie gets up, lets out a couple of sentences, and he says, the baby's very disturbing. Could somebody shut that baby up? <laughs> so I see this woman whisk her baby out of the room, absolutely mortified. I have to tell you, we were all absolutely mortified. It was not a charming moment. Um, maybe a 74-year-old can get away with that today, but when you're like 38 or 39, eh, it didn't work all that well. So the Bernie story is out of the way. <laughs> Let me first describe for you the three major issues that are what this election is all about, what the ramifications are of those issues. And then from there, I'd like to shift over into the changing demographics of the United States and how those demographics are played out in this election. This is a very important one. But let's start with the issues. And the first is the economy. But it's not just the usual kinds of measurements about unemployment and how many are in the labor force and so on. Because as you know, the un unemployment rate is half of what it was. There's been you know, a tremendous amount of progress. There are more people in the workforce and so on. But the problem is that there are a growing number of Americans who know that they're losing ground. I started tracking this number in 1987, a very simple question. Do you or anyone in your household work at a job that pays less than your previous job? And in 1987, there were 14% nationwide, and I found that to be pretty astounding, in fact. So, you know, we hear about recessions. We just began in the early 80s to hear about America's first structural recession, meaning people unemployed, and, but they weren't going to go back to the factory when inventories ran. They were unemployed, and they were going to continue to be unemployed. And then in the early 90s, we began to talk about the angry white male. Remember, that's what the Perot movement was all about, the angry white male. And there was this direct relationship between people working for less and the angry white male who'd been left behind. So we've continued with that angry white male, but I'll tell you what also has in, uh, increased. And that is that as we moved on into the 90s, a boom period, by the end of that decade, the end of the century, 19% of adults are working at a job that pays less. When I wrote my first book, The Way Will Be, and the manuscript went to the publisher in late 2007, I was just simply astounded that 26% we're now working at a job that pays less until we get to just last month where 37% are working at a job that pays less than a previous job. So when people feel that they're losing ground, it's because they really are losing ground. And how has it expressed itself? Well, there's anger, there's bitterness. First and foremost, what we see for the first time in our history in the last couple of decades is a genuine feeling of status anxiety. Meaning, we all kind of identify ourselves as members of the middle class. That has nothing to do with income. That's a state of mind. 
It's a cultural and a psychological thing. But for the first time, we've begun to hear people say, I was middle class, I'm not middle class anymore. And the status anxiety also translates into their kids and the sense that, look, middle class, and I did everything I was supposed to do, and I played by all the rules, and we saved, and we sent the kids to school, and then what happened? They're in debt, their future's in question, they may not be middle class, they won't do as well as we've done, and we're not doing so well. These are real numbers. The anger also expresses itself in this really fascinating term, phraseology, that Tom Edsel writes about. The new haves versus the new have-nots. And we get away from the notion of the billionaire class versus the 99%. Americans do not dislike billionaires. Americans don't resent. In fact, I've been testing this for over 20 years. Open-ended. What's the first thing you think about when you hear the word billionaire? And I hear good fortune, luck, talent, success, hard work, but hardly anything ever really pejorative. The new haves versus the new have-nots are fascinating. It is people in the same status, income-wise. Private employees versus public employees. Private employees saying, look what they get and we're paying for it. And this is very sad when a middle class starts to eat itself. That's a very, very sad phenomenon. And so there is frustration, and there is anger, and there is resentment, not at billionaires, but we see this and hear this all the time, at people who don't play by the same rules as I play. Why am I playing by the rules and why are they not play, playing by the rules? That's the resentment that people feel towards Wall Street. So this gets played out in this campaign because there are genuine economic, personal, fun, financial resentments that people have and they've come to a boil. Which then leads to our second dominant issue and that's demographics and culture. And essentially, the battle, and it's not new, because it's cyclical in our history, is that sense of white, traditional, middle-class society with traditional values versus what on earth has happened to my community? What on earth has happened to my world? Immigrants? Refugees? Gays want to be married? Transgender? I mean, I look at this North Carolina thing and I recall I had a business for 28 years. My son runs it now. And we used to have people come in and work in our call center all day. And we had a receptionist who was transgender. And she used the ladies' room. And the little old ladies, they used to call themselves Zogby's Call Girls. I love that. <laughs> they had a delegation, and they came to me and said, we're very concerned that Tanisha is using the ladies' room. And I was thinking to myself, does anybody really want to look at your thing? I don't think so. Um, why don't you just go to the ladies' room and close the door? That's a start. If 
Tanisha is bad. You don't need a new law. She's got a problem. Call the police. But don't say who can go to what bathroom and who can't go to one. But you see, there's a lot more going on. There is a sense that my America, my community, my world is slipping away. And this is the flip side of the demographics that we all know. We will be a majority-minority country. Many of our communities are already majority-minority. Add to that the cultural changes, the sexual revolution, and now you've got people who really cannot deal with the changes and want their old world to come back. And it's not. So that leads then to our third and our final dominant issue, which is foreign policy. And this is the way to understand foreign policy. Donald Trump wants to make America great again. What's that mean? That means bombing, torture, nobody's going to push us around, everybody's going to respect us. As Bobby Jindal would say, how can the rest of the world respect a country that elects a guy who's got a dead squirrel on top of his head? <laughs> Sorry about that, but that's what Bobby Jindal said that, and I'm just your messenger here. But the bottom line is, if you want to understand the foreign policy issue, then essentially it is American exceptionalism and American military might versus the end of an empire. And then if you want to further understand, take the age of 50 and draw a line. If you are 50 and older, and the older you get, you subscribe to that post-World War II, Cold War, us versus them, good versus evil kind of world, the American century. That is what you grew up with. That was the moonshot. That was the victory in the Cold War. That was Ronald Reagan. And then you take those who are 50 and younger, and the younger you get, and there is that sense, starting with Vietnam, but being driven home even further with Iraq and Afghanistan and ISIS and all of that myriad of problems that there are severe limitations to what America can do. And that in fact, what America can, thinks it can do and must do often is at a point of diminishing returns that actually comes in and makes the situation worse. And so that's kind of the issue the three issues in a nutshell, and that perfectly leads now to the changing demographics of this country. So when Senator Barack Obama ran in 2008, he put together a winning coalition that is one of the dominant winning coalitions in our country's history. We get these every 20 years. Or I, I'm sorry, every generation. The New Deal Coalition, Roosevelt put together liberal intellectuals and southern white farmers. He put together, um, for the very first time, some African Americans and white working class and elderly, and that lasted until the Reagan election and Reagan revolution, now the, the children and grandchildren of the New Deal coalition were comfortably in the, ensconced in the suburbs. Remember the Reagan revolution? They were, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the Reagan Democrats. These were people less dependent on government largesse who are actually watching from the vantage point of being taxpayers, paying for 
the New Deal and the Great Society. And then we shift another generation to the Obama coalition, composed of four major groups. First are Latinos. You gotta understand, we have to understand the revolution in our midst. If you go back to the 1992 election, 92 million voters turned out. Latinos were 4% of that 92 million. Four years later, they were 5% of 96 million. In 2000, they were 6% of 105 million. In 2004, they were 8% of 122 million. 2008, 9.1% of 132 million voters. 2012, 10.1%. I'm showing off now, don't worry. When I get back to the airport in Syracuse, I won't remember where I parked my car, but there are some <laughs> things that I do okay. 2012, 10.1% of 131, 132 million voters. Just an article today, they're expecting 13.1 million Latinos to turn out to vote in November. Now, that coalition, Latinos, you know, generally, Reagan was able to get about 40%. George W. Bush in 2004 got almost 40%. By 2008, by 2008, the damage had begun, and John McCain, who had generally been friendly to the community, but the party wasn't, John McCain got 31% of that huge Latino vote, and Mitt Romney only got 28, 29% of that huge Latino vote. Now, where do we stand today? Well, you know, Obama got 74% of the Latino vote in 2012. Has the GOP done anything except alienated the Latino vote? They said, well, we've got Marco Rubio and Ted. No, that's not going to stop the bleeding. It's just simply not going to stop the bleeding. So we're looking at an increased Latino vote and an increased portion of that Latino vote that'll vote Democrat. The big issue is, will they come out to vote for Hillary? Sure. Why? Because they're fired up. They will come out to vote against the GOP. I learned this. I actually did focus groups for a group affiliated with the GOP in the late 90s. Remember Prop 187 in California? Just an article, an interview that I read in The Economist, interviewing Governor Pete Wilson about that albatross around his neck. And the Latino support for the GOP had plummeted by the mid to late 90s. And I went around doing focus groups of Hispanics, of Latino voters, it was very simple tautology, they told me. Whether they were like Susana Martinez, whose family goes back 450 years, or they had just crossed the border. The communities all over California, Arizona, Texas, all throughout the United States, they said anti-illegal means anti-immigrant to us, and anti-immigrant means anti-Hispanic, period. My job wasn't to say, because I couldn't say. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, that's how it was interpreted. All right, so that's the first part of the winning coalition and the changing face of the electorate. Number two are African Americans. Now, typically in a nationwide election, African Americans are 10% of the total vote. When Barack Obama ran in 2008, they were 12.9% of the total vote. So that's almost three percentage points. 
And when you consider that he got 93% of the African-American vote, every African-American that turns out to vote, pretty much turns out to vote for a Democrat. They were 13.1% of the total vote in 2012. There had been some talk that they were disappointed, but they were going to support their brother in 2012, especially to preserve the legacy. That's what they told us. So, in a nutshell, what does that mean? African Americans are not, not a growing portion of the population. They are a growing portion of the electorate. Will they come out to vote for Hillary? Again, it's not going to be a question of voting for so much as it is voting against. Being voting against someone that they consider to be, or a party they consider to be antithetical to their needs. So thirdly, millennials spent a lot of time speaking about millennials, studying millennials for the last 14 years, writing books on millennials. We're looking at people born from 1979 now through 1997. Think about this. There are 83 million millennials in the United States today. How big is that? That is already 5 million more than the number of baby boomers. They're already that much larger, and I don't see an end to their numbers just yet. In fact, I don't assign a name to people until, I, um, until they reach 18, but already the preliminary studies of people, people Americans who are in their teens already indicate that the trends continue, especially when it comes to gender and sexuality. The fact that those trends continue even further. Now, who are they? Here's what you need to know. 66% of millennials have passports and have traveled abroad. When I wrote my first book, I was astounded to report, this was in 07, 08, 23% telling us, I expect, not hope or wish, I expect to live and work in a foreign capital at some point in my life, 46% today. Back in 2007, 73% said, I want to leave this world because of something that I did, making it a better place. That's 85%. Those numbers are so far different than any other age cohort. 62% say that it is important that I be fluent in a foreign language in order to pursue my career. Now, are they? No. But no pollster would have even thought of asking that question 10 or 15 or more years ago. They're different. What do I hear? They're not 9 to 5. No, they're 7 and 24. We ask them, who's in your social network? The lowest number, 31%, say there's somebody in my social network from sub-Saharan Africa. They are America's first globals. 24%, seven points higher than when I wrote the first book, 24%, it is very likely that I and a spouse or significant other will be on two different continents simultaneously. 23%, it is likely that we will raise a child living on two separate continents. Completely and totally different. These are America's first global citizens. These are the kids who played more soccer than baseball and football. These are the kids who watched MTV News. And MTV News was all about kids 
everywhere else, just like me. This age cohort has grown up without a sense of the other, like the rest of us have. These are people just like me. When 9-11 hit, I didn't know what to expect. And when I started doing polling, I thought, started doing polling among Americans and then in particular millennials about the impact, I thought that they would react the same way that my economics professor taught me back so many years ago. He was of the greatest generation. He said, we were just talking Saturday night, December 6th, 1941, we were talking about girls in the dorm. We were talking about beer and sports. But Monday morning, quarter to seven, even before selective service opened, we were standing outside to defend our country and its honor. These kids, the millennials, obviously reflecting the horror of 9-11, but this, whoa, wait, I want to find out why. These are the kids, then, that grew up without the sense of American exceptionalism. Oh, they, I mean, obviously, they love this country and love living here, but they're global citizens, and they tell us we're global citizens. So what about them? 66% of 18 to 29-year-olds voting in record numbers voted for Barack Obama. And then 61% in 2012 came back and voted for Barack Obama. Now, what does that mean? We were seeing five, six days before the 2012 election. You remember that race was pretty close. It was very close between Romney and Obama. And Obama's polling 52, 53% among 18 to 29 year olds. Remember, there are more millennials, they're older but he's only at 52, 53%. Then we see Friday night, Saturday night, 54%, 55%, 58%. He ends up on election day 61% of 18 to 29 year olds. So we did our post-election survey. One of the important questions is why? And what we discovered was young men did not show up in as high numbers to even vote in 2012 as they had in 2008. And they were a little split. They leaned towards Obama, but they were a little split. It was young women who voted in record numbers, 73% of whom voted for Obama. When we asked why, they said, oh, no, we, we were disappointed too. But the other side scared us. They were talking about things that really frightened us. Contraception. The Pope doesn't even talk about contraception, but the GOP candidates were. What are we expecting? I don't know if you know this, but if you take that group, 18 to 37 years of age, that leans heavily Democrat, in fact, Harvard just published a study yesterday. 40% identify themselves as Democrat. 20% as Republican. The rest are independent. But if you take that group, that in itself, 18 to 37, can be 36% of the electorate on election day. And the further thing that you have to note is that that entire age cohort, as I said, is 40% non-white. And non-white, over three out of four non-white voters vote Democrat. So lastly, we have, as part of the coalition, what my buddy Richard Florida calls the creative class. The creative class. That's 40 million and growing who work in the, quote, knowledge sector. So they work universities and healthcare, media and entertainment, technology. 
broad education, a broad array of sectors within that broad knowledge sector. Where are they located? Oh, all over the country. But the big pockets are found in a number of the swing states. So when you look at your red and blue map, think North Carolina, New Hampshire. Southern New Hampshire is in the Boston zone. Creative class, Manchester, Concord, Portsmouth. North Carolina, Raleigh, the Research Triangle, Asheville, Southern Florida, the swing states, Columbus, Cleveland, Dayton, Cincinnati, Des Moines and Ames, Iowa, the creative class, they can be fiscally conservative, but they are socially liberal. And that's the thing that we need to understand. And we also need to understand that a growing portion of America's creative class are non-white. So the real issue, as I come to a close here, is what's the Republican Party doing here? In some ways, I've already written this, and this isn't partisan, I'm being objective. I've told you, I've worked for Republicans. John McCain was a, a client. I actually worked for Newt. I worked for, I'm either ruggedly independent or such a political whore that you've never seen anybody <laughs> worse. But I've learned a lot polling both sides. I've learned a lot about language and about culture and messaging and so on. And so I think the GOP in this country is at what I call, and I've written this in Forbes a couple of times, at the, the Federalist moment. You may recall that George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams were Federalists. And the Federalists were in kind of an even balance with the Jeffersonian Republicans. And then what happened, 1814, 1815, the War of 1812, we were, no need to get into the details, but the Federalists took a stand. And the stand was against the trend of the country. As new people were moving into territories and new people were moving into that new Louisiana territory, they were becoming Jeffersonians. And the Federalists died, got trounced in 1816. And then the party still had state and local elected officials, even into the late 1820s, but they were no longer a national party. The GOP today is already beset by factions, even before you get into personalities. You have kind of the establishment moderate conservatives, you have the strong fiscal conservatives, the budget hawks. You have the Paul, father and son libertarians. You have the Christian social conservatives. And then you have the Tea Party, which is kind of a conglomeration of a few of those groups. These are factions and they already hate each other. If you watch the debates, and I had to, <laughs> But the question they always ask and always confused me is, who is the real conservative? Not who's the real American, who is the real leader, who is the person with solutions, who is the real conservative? And that doesn't lend itself to bonding at all. Now, add, throw in the personality, the personalities, and I think you have a party that is I think hopelessly on its way to extinction. What would be the one caveat? Is that they get to run against a pretty damaged Democratic candidate. And, you know, with Hillary, and I know Hillary, but I don't know Hillary. I've sat and I've talked to her and I've told her twice. I sat and I told her, I don't know who you are. 
And I met with her. I was invited to do a briefing. Uh, this is the was the third time that I had briefed the Senate Democrats. Hillary couldn't go to that briefing, but she asked to meet with me privately on one of the upper floors in the Senate chamber. And she said, tonight we're going to vote on the war in Iraq, and I'm going to vote for it. I wanted you to know, and I said, you are making a decision that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. No, 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 she said. He's six months away from nuclear capability. And I said, I got a good question. What is he going to do with it? I know it's hard to assume that a barbarian could be anything but a barbarian, but no leader is going to let force a bomb that's going to mean the kind of reaction that's going to create a parking lot out of the country he's been governing. And then what happens when we go to war? And, well, blah, blah, blah. You know the rest of the story. Her point is that she doesn't convey any of that. So many people distrust her. Luckily for her, so many more people find Donald Trump to be scary beyond terms. Isn't this great? Bottom line is the thing that could undo her, aside from an indictment, those don't always help candidacies, you know. Um, but what could really dog her, I think, is the foundation, the Clinton Foundation, which does good things, but it raises dirty money, and that dirty money looks like it's to buy access to a Secretary of State or to the next president, and that's not a good thing. So can I end on a happy note? No, but we'll do a um, we'll do a Q and A now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Oh, wait Great. a second. Before you go any further, in our Q and A, I'm going to recommend some books that I think you should read. But there's only one book that I want you to buy, and that's my book, it's, and it's, it's on sale. There. Yes, great. Back great. there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Great work. Thank you. Um, um, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Karam Dana. I'm an assistant professor in IIS, the Interdisciplinary School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences here at the University of Washington, Bothell. I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank our distinguished guests today. Um, because I happen to be the moderator, so I get to ask the first question. And because I study American Muslims, the first question is about American Muslims. I want to specifically ask a question in relation to how Trump rhetoric, again, it's not necessarily a question that we, you know, most of you are thinking about, uh, but the sort of rhetoric that is used by Donald Trump in, um, you know, in an attempt uh, to galvanize much of the vote from the Republican Party. He uses that rhetoric that is, in our opinion, in my opinion, and many of you, I, I suppose, um, and I'm sure, that's quite dangerous because it really isolates one particular mm -hmm. uh, minority group here. Um, and as someone who studies this population, I can see the anxieties uh, within this community. So while you're telling me in some ways that the millennials or the future is in the hands of the millennials, there seems to be some polarization that's taking place mm -hmm. through rhetorical uh, messaging that's done by someone like Donald Trump. Um, and clearly, this doesn't necessarily um, alone affect uh, American Muslims per se. But in the sense, it, it has, in, in some ways, it has its kind of a, uh, um, an effect that affects all other racial uh, uh, groups and minorities in the United States. Um, in, in a sense, it's really bringing the question of anxieties uh, that might potentially be economic in terms of their route that you've discussed mm -hmm. earlier, but bringing it into the realm of the racial politics that have plagued quite a lot of our history in the United States. So how do you see uh, the, that polarization and in terms of how the G GOP as a political party is, it seems to be dismantling? There are a number of, uh, let me tick them off. Um, uh, number one, it, it is of no appeal whatsoever to millennials. In fact, it's the very thing that will draw them out to vote against mm -hmm. 
the GOP. And you, and you saw that while the, you know, the other candidates jumped on Trump for that, they didn't jump too much. much. All right, secondly, um, American Muslims vote overwhelmingly Democrat. Now, that's interesting because they hadn't. George W. They voted for George W. Bush, 42 to 38, in, uh, in the uh, 2004 election. By 2008, well over 80% of American Muslims, who are fairly conservative, you know, uh, or include a number of conservatives, but voted. Um, thirdly is the impact on the rest of the world. And the message that, do you really want to be picking a fight with countries that we rely upon and increasingly rely upon, but also do you want to be picking a fight with a group of crazy criminals who are just baiting you? Uh, what, what's the end game here? Why, why do you want to get them even more angry? Uh, when you don't quite have a handle yet on how you're going to destroy them. So, yeah, it's a very, very big issue. And fourthly, on a very personal level, it does create a great amount of, of anxiety. Of and the anxiety is not simply a perception. The anxiety is very real. Mm -hmm. It's not only from the vantage point of racial, pro of, of Muslim, anti-Muslim profiling, but it's also, you know, from the, the vantage point of uh, law enforcement coming sure. into communities mm -hmm. and, and, um, and buying spies mm -hmm. and actually spying and splitting the community by getting more favorable people to, to spy on people that they determine to be less than favorable. It's, it's worrying. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we'll open the floor to questions. Please. Yep. Please. Sort of conclusion of the Republican Party. So let's sort of say, like hypothetically, that just all hell breaks loose for the Republicans in November. They, they lose the White House, uh, they lose the Senate, and they lose at least most control of the House. Could you talk a little bit more concretely about what you think that would look like, that actual implosion? And what I mean by that is, are we talking about sort of some transformation of the party, something that's going to take place over four, maybe 10 years? Good uh, question. Election cycles. Would we expect to see something along the lines of what we saw in 2010, sort of a Tea Party type of way? Or do you actually mean the actual implosion of the party and maybe the creation of new parties to fix or a new party itself? That's a very good question. So let's, let's start with some history. Okay, so when the Federalists died, um, there, were, there was left the Jeffersonian Republicans. By 1824, there were four distinct regional Jeffersonian Republican candidates for president. It didn't take until 1828 for Andrew Jackson, one of the more successful of those four, to form what was called the democracy. And that was a Democratic Party that was born. And then uh, there was the Democrats, and then to counter the Democrats, the remnants of the Jeffersonians became the Whig Party, which split, as you know, over slavery, and split into the American Party, the Know Nothings, that was a more conservative, pro union party, the anti slavery or free soil, anyway, that didn't want slavery to expand were the Republicans. They fielded their first candidate two years later who lost, and then Lincoln won with a, a minority in, in 1860. And those are the two parties, Democrats and Republicans, that have held on and actually changed philosophy um, and changed political bases. But we're at a moment here where for, for a number of reasons, one of which is demographics that the, the, the Republican Party has no appeal to the growing uh, demographics in this country. What happens? I look at millennials again. Now, by 2020 and 2024, millennials and younger folks similar to millennials are now going to be 18 to 44, 18 to 45 years of age. They're going to be half, more than half, of the electorate, and what I see among millennials is a completely different debate. 
libertarian versus communitarian. Softer ideologies that will realign, but I also uh, realign the political parties so Democrats don't take cheer because you are a political party that while you win today, your structure is antithetical to what millennials are all about. They're not hierarchical. They are devoted to problem solving, to direct democracy, to social networking, to forming temporary coalitions to get the job done. So what will be the ultimate party structure? I don't know, but it won't be hierarchical. May, may, you, I, may yeah. I interject here for a moment? Please, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I, I only wanted to, to just say that in this world of technology, you don't really need to have party, local party, precinct to chairman, and precincts for that matter. This generation, because of the technology that it masters, transcends space and geography as well. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, one question, if I may interrogate that question if possible. So, don't you think that a Tea Party like so, sort of like uh, gathering, uh, to say the least, will kind of, you know, it seems that we're headed in that direction, mm -hmm. right? Because a Tea Party would potentially emerge out of this implosion or hypothetical implosion, let's call it that, being an academic here. Um, so, and that's really the very thing that Donald Trump seems to have been doing, right? Which, to, in a sense, kind of polarizing the, the Republican Party. And what, what I see coming out of this is a Tea Party-like type of an institution that has xenophobic tendencies and has anxieties that potentially could be rooted in economic issues or economic structural changes that have been taking place for decades, uh, but really materializing within the rhetorical that is race-based rhetoric. So, uh, so that's on the one hand, versus the millennials. I mean, in a sense, it seems that there will be a larger battle in, through the future. As, I mean, you know, again, mm -hmm. you know, we're all thinking about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but, but in the sense, the millennials are not necessarily buying into these types of rhetorical uh, uh, messaging, right? You will have factions. Mm -hmm. There'll be a Tea Party faction, to, to be sure. But just remember, uh, and forgive me for being esoteric here, but just remember that there was indeed a Ku Klux Klan yeah. in the 1860s after tremendous change. And there was, again, that was anti-immigrant in the 1920s and then in the 1960s, but the march continued. Mm -hmm. They were against the demographic trend. The factions were large enough to cause pain. Mm -hmm. The xenophobia was rooted in every case because of tremendous economic dislocation like today. The important thing, though, is that when we move beyond the economic dislocation, has anyone ever studied American history and heard anyone write about, oh, do you remember the good old days when we used to beat the crap out of immigrants? Does anybody remember when we used to pound the hell out of Catholics? Well, those are those blips. Them. Well, yeah, some people sure, do, sure. I'm sure. There, there are those blips, but, but history marches on. So, yeah. Right. Yep. Amal, please. At the very beginning of your presentation, I think, speaking as a psychologist, we, we have a lot of research that shows that people respond to the issue of fairness, even though they may be. Uh, People respond to the issue yeah, of fairness. People respond to the issue of fairness, even infants, young young children, all the way through. So I think one could sum up a lot of what you were saying about that people think it's unfair, and that's, and Americans are very fair-minded people. My question, speaking as a radical, um, what would be the opportunity that we might have if Trump were elected, would we have a counter movement? Would that bring on some real coalition of uh, rebellious response? I was an American historian. I'm a recovering academic. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a historian of the American left. 
And that's the old Trotskyist mm -hmm. argument. You know, ah, you mean the worse things get, the better they get. Elect Nixon. That's exactly what we want, because he'll screw up everything and that'll make the people right. No, I learned very simply that the worse things get, the worse things get. And I think that's a rule of thumb. Now, wh what about Donald Trump? This, was a, this is a vanity campaign gone awry, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, here's a guy who's thought, I don't have any direct evidence, just observation. I'm gonna have some fun for a few months. They're believing this. <laughs> oh my God. And then the showman, you know, is looking at CNN. When have 24 million people watched CNN? 15 million people watching MSNBC. On a good night, Chris Matthews has the population of Burlington, Vermont <laughs> watching him, you know? So, yeah, look. I just can't fathom that a guy who does business all over the world, you know, in Dubai and Sao Paulo, Mexico City, that he believes any of this. But the thing is, he believes how the crowd is reacting yes, yes, to him, that's and that's really troubling, yep, yep. very troubling. On the flip side, you got Ted Cruz, who does believe all this stuff. God help us all. <laughs> yes, well, good luck with that. You mentioned the notion of uh, Hillary and the foundation and the idea that there's tainted money in the foundation and so on. Um, comment, if you will, on how much of that is, is thought to be real, that, that, that conflict of interest, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, perception and uh, uh, the activity that the opposition is, is taking to make something of it. That's a good point. What I do know is that what has been revealed um, are the folks that they have raised money from who have admitted why they raised money. So, I mean, for example, um, Bill Clinton gets offered $650,000 to have a short meeting with the President and the Prime Minister of the Republic of Congo and uh, do a photo op. Now, they're the ones who said, we needed to talk to the Secretary of State. And now, Clinton, Bill, uh, this was Hillary as Secretary of State. Bill goes to the State Department for clearance to give the speech, and they deny him the clearance. But I mean, I'm, I just got to ask myself, why would you even go? $650,000? to have a photo op with two guys of questionable, this is the poorest nation on earth. Uh, why would you even bother? And they always give fuel. Mm -hmm. There's always that smoke. Now, I also know that a substantial percentage of the money that's raised um, is to take care of Clinton people. Now, I, I'm going to admit to you, I am a liberal Democrat. I already made fun of Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, there's a part of me that likes Hillary, but damn, why are you always in that position? What's that? So who are you voting for? Just, never mind. Uh, um, it's a good question. Yeah, hi. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you um, you Democrats. mentioned um, the Ku Klux Klan and how those like sort of like right wing movements occurred. So um, there's an article by Samuel Huntington or, uh, about the Hispanization of America in the Southwest. Hispanization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and pretty much what his his assertion is that the growing like Latin American population in the American Southwest is going to create a. Uh, not a like a working class sort of opposition, so it's like the KKK, but more of a middle class white uh, opposition because they aren't able to cooperate with like not being able to speak English or Spanish in institutions that will change because of the growing demographics. How do you see that 
moving forward with the which is with with that base that Trump has tapped into so far. So now he like tapped into the working class, but it's also moving forward is going to resonate and be more open than mm -hmm. what Simo Huntington. Okay, so talked. so let's just sort of tick off responses in, in no special order. You know, one one clear response is that that um, uh, that growth in and of itself will produce uh, a reaction, uh, but we have a new and a next economy on its way. We're in a very difficult position right now. We're in, betwixt and between an old economy that has the impact that we all know about and a next economy uh, that has the capacity to produce an enormous amount of growth. Well, this is an epical period. Should be plenty to, to share over a longer period of time. Secondly, is that when we, when, when we think of Hispanics, we also have to remember that from the point of view of Hispanics, I've polled Mexico in a number of times. One of the questions that, that I ask is, what do you consider the Southwest? 57% of Mexicans consider the Southwest as part of Mexico. They don't even see that border, which is really interesting. The third thing is, as I mentioned um, in a, a phrase, is that when you look at Hispanics and the Hispanization, we're going back to Junipero Serra. We're going back to early migrants who crossed the border. We're going back to the explorers. We're going back to 450 years of America. Susana Martinez, governor of New Mexico, goes back, you know, I, I happened to be in Santa Fe when St. Francis the Cathedral celebrated its 500th anniversary. Wow. 500th anniversary. So, yeah, there are the Pat Buchanans of the world who will tell you, yes, but our core is Anglo-Saxon. But there are tens of millions of people who, are not who will tell you, no, not entirely. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, one more question? Oh, I, I'll take more. Oh. I'm, I don't sure. leave till tomorrow. That's great. Um, there is one more question out there. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, please. Well, uh, a friend of mine started, started a, uh, a petition, and the base of it is saying that uh, our superdelegates should vote with the majority of the people of mm -hmm their state and um, so his argument is well we went through our caucus we have shown that we're basically a bernie state however our super delegates are probably not going to be voting bernie so is there a point where there's a disillusionment within americans on this system and i'm thinking of maybe even the democratic party of, well, will there be a disillusionment within the party structure and the system? Yes to all the above. This, the, this discussion is not over, particularly on the Democratic side. Now, just briefly, very briefly, the notion of superdelegates was a response to the McGovern rules of the Democratic National Committee. Because Mayor Daley and the establishment uh, wing of the party that nominated Hubert Humphrey in 1968 where it was that coalition of labor groups, uh, was anti-civil rights, and, and so on. George McGovern was appointed as the part of the Bobby Kennedy legacy to write new rules for the DNC. So he did. In 1972, we had situations where 19-year-old kids were winning. 19-year-old kid in Rye, New York, beat Averill Harriman, the former governor and icon, to become a delegate to the DNC. So 1972 was very diverse. Uh, you had Native American headdress, you had Latinos, you had uh, African Americans from Mississippi who couldn't be seated four years earlier, and now they're all at the convention. Who wasn't there? George Meany of the AFL CIO wasn't there. Richard Daly wasn't there. They were furious. And ultimately, what happened was one of the reasons why McGovern lost, one of the reasons why he lost, is that they didn't vote for him. 
They sat on their hands. And so the superdelegates were the response to the McGovern rule. Look, elect delegates, but let's be sure that our party establishment is here. This is a political party with a structure, with leadership, with bosses, with big labor, and all that sort of stuff. And now that argument is coming to a head. And again, I hate to be Johnny One Note about this, but it comes down to millennials who have no sense of hierarchy and who say, hey, if we vote one way, if my state votes one way, then that's what ought to, that, this discussion is not over. Yeah. But, but then there's a problem clearly within the structure of the party, oh, yeah. in the sense, you know, this has to be dealt with one way or another. Yeah. Um, there was a question. Sir, John? Thank you for coming to um, the university. Assuming it's Clinton versus uh, uh, Trump in the general election, are, in your judgment, are we likely to see these candidates move to the center of American politics on issues that sound like how we address baby boomers? Or, or do you think there's a chance that there may be a clash between, between Hillary and, and Donald Trump, who seems to have enlisted, as much as we ridicule him, he is clearly uh, sounding, uh, resonating with, with various sectors in American society, whether it's racism, uh, which I think not, but more, more fear, fear of immigration, fear of losing your job, fear of losing manufacturing. But are, do you think that there's a chance that Hillary Clinton might actually confront him in, a re, in real terms? I'm concerned because, you know, she promised to meet with Benjamin Netanyahu within two weeks of having become president of the United States. She does not seem to be someone who will counter what appear to be racist strains coming in from, from Donald Trump. Will she counter them or will she speak in terms that only baby boomers understand that, that are in the, in the center as he runs to the same place? Well, you know, I've said about Hillary, she reminds me of the Crosby, Still, Nash uh, song, Love the One You're With. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> yes. um, you know, she is a party establishment figure and she knows you win an election in the center. So you haven't seen the end of who Hillary is this year yet. She has to move to the center. Um, and she'll do that after she has comfortably gotten the nomination, finessed the support. Bernie's got a supporter. He, he just has to do Elizabeth Warren as well, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Um, that will be enough. How do you get millennials out? Well, you, Donald Trump just scares the bejesus. They will. Uh, so they'll, they, they, they will gross, come out yeah. to vote. That coalition will remain healthy. Now, um, on the Trump side of things, here is a guy who sees something that works for him, who doesn't, need to, doesn't feel he needs to be anything else. Uh, there will be efforts to drive him to the center, which is probably, personally, where he already is. But he's already having a fight with Paul Manafort, who is about his establishment uh, a figure as you can get. I wouldn't be surprised if Manafort quits or is dumped in the next few days because nobody tells the Donald, you know, what to do. So now, what do you get when you get Hillary? I have no idea whatsoever. I live in New York. I'm an Arab American. I watched that debate in New York. She she did the kind of pandering she didn't even have to do. I mean, that, that, that was beyond the pale. It was insulting. And there were a considerable number of, of liberal Jews who were very troubled by that. You can sort of be pandered to death, you know, and, and she, she did that. She's for the $15 an hour minimum wage. You see the look on Bernie's face? You were just talking against it last night. Well, this is now. And somebody asked, She's very, she'll be very fortunate to face Donald Trump because the further issue there is those um, Senate and House candidates who, no photo ops, please don't have Donald come into town, um, who are stuck now with the GOP label. See, the brand, I think, is broken. I think irreparably. We'll see. Okay, there's a question there. One, please go. 
Hi. Hi. Huda. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I would like to hear your uh, opinion about the discourse on Israel and what we're doing in this country about Israel. About Israel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, you, we, we just talked about Hillary and the pandering last time. One thing we need to understand again, I mentioned that 50-year-old split on foreign policy. It very much exists on the issue of Israel and Palestine. Now, um, are millennials, do they lean more to Israel than to Palestine? Yes, but not nearly as much. They tend to blame both sides. They tend to not grasp intractable problems. Why can't you just resolve it? There's a real impatience. And with millennials, there is no sense of the myth of David Ben-Gurion, the myth of the, you know, making the desert bloom and all that. There is only a sense of where Israel is at today, and Benjamin Netanyahu gets his lowest numbers among American millennials of, of any world leader. Could, could, I, could I add a little piece to that question? So the changing discourse on the question of Palestine and Israel with relation to how the new younger generation millennials view it, what do you think the role of technology now is? Now that you, someone can actually take a video camera and take, shoot a video of someone shooting someone who is basically yeah. disarmed and on the, on the ground and literally <coughs> executions taking place right and left. So now, how does that change the mentality of the American public when it gets to voting. And again, it's not necessarily, oftentimes it's framed as us <coughs> versus them, Muslims versus Christian. Again, Christian Palestinians are also under occupation. Yeah. So that's a real situation that's really, you know, how does that change the mentality once they see these types of images? Now? Well, you know, what it does is it offers an opportunity for Palestinians to do something they've never really been allowed to do, mm -hmm. which is to tell a story. Yep. And kids are very technologically and video inclined. But I have to tell you something. It's not directly related, but you'll capture the story and the metaphor. I had the privilege of polling and doing focus groups in Tunisia during the first election, October of 2011. And I spent some time over there. And those young kids um, were so powerful. And they, they took out their iPhones. I made this revolution, they said. There was still this sense of, of, of optimism. Um, and how did they make the revolution? Well, we never left the apartment. We were just constantly in touch with, with our network. But you know what? 24 focus groups, every single one of those focus groups, somebody said, what do the American kids think of us? Do they think we're cool? I just thought, that's so powerful. There's an opportunity through that technology yep. to tell a story that other channels have not allowed the story to be told through. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a question here. We'll get to you. Okay. And a couple more, please, sir. Healthcare is an issue that affects all of these groups. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly near 30% of our US economy. And certainly Obamacare you know, if you look at historical events in this last, you know, eight years, it, it, you know, it has been very dramatic. Yet, when, when you watch the debates and so forth, as something that's driving the election, it's almost like it's fallen to be a footnote, you know, as if people are not worried about it. You know, what do your polls, you know, what's happening in, in that realm? It just surprises me that it's not out front end only briefly, you know, in the debates brought up, and almost like the Vanity Affair type events are the headliners. Well, you know, the past two years, the Republicans have had to govern because they control a majority, and they haven't governed. And so very simply, one of their planks is, you know, to repeal Obamacare, make sure that they get control of all three uh, branches of government, and they haven't been able to repeal Obamacare to date. They possibly have learned, don't make promises that you can't keep. And I think the third thing that they've got to realize is if you give something 
you're not going to win popularity taking it away. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't work like that. And so it's not a winner for them. In the primaries, yeah, you know, um, all, it's a disaster. It's the worst thing. How many disasters are there? Uh, Donald Trump would say, disastrous foreign policy. Our view towards nuclear weapons, it's a disaster. Obamacare is a disaster. But the fact of the matter is there's 17 million people receiving a disaster right now. Yep. I'm not going to take it away. Um, one last question, sir. And my uh, question actually bounces off of that one um, regarding health care reform. You mentioned the Tea Party and, and their rise to um, American politics. And healthcare reform was one of the issues that really allowed them to um, rise up. Yep. And what, in your opinion, is the key element of, of healthcare reform that arouses people to be so um, um, passionate about it? You know, in the 90s, when Bill Clinton was trying to pass healthcare reform, initially it was very popular. It didn't see, and even see the light of day in Congress. And even after um, the Affordable Care Act passed, it's still relatively controversial when you look at polling as far as people who support it. And, um, and there's a lot of you know, sub-polling within the polling that it's, it, it, they kind of um, counter one another. So what is it that you feel is the central element of healthcare, particularly that divides people so much um, and that makes it very, very emotional? Well, in Clinton's time and prior to that, it was seen as, um, as uh, another uh, 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 welfare scheme, and how do we afford it? But fast forward up to now, and very simply, it's the universal mandate. Even though the universal mandate idea was born in Boston, yep. as we know, under Mitt Romney, uh, uh, together with Ted Kennedy. And so while that has, has certainly been a factor, uh, you know, the, the fact is that it's been up upheld. Um, don't know where you're going to where are you going to go with it? So it's, it's rhetorically sound in a Republican primary, but as we saw in 2008 and in 2012, what works in a Republican primary is not necessarily all that beneficial to work in a general election. Demographics are still against the GOP. The Electoral College as it's constituted, is against the GOP. They have to do something really extraordinary or add another factor. Um, you know, the, the eight is enough rule. Has America had it with Barack Obama and time for a change? He's the only guy pulling around 50 that's out there, you know? Um, nobody else even comes close. So there, there's nothing extraordinary that allows them to get the edge in this election with the possible exception of what could blow up on Hillary. Great. Okay, John, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all very much. I want to thank John for such a wonderful talk, and I want to thank our chancellor and his office. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Wolfier, and thank you all for coming, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year with our next events, so thank you for coming.